Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Eric, today's um, today's admin, and uh, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing a man who needs no introduction, but is going to get one anyway. The world famous Zach Twomley of the When Diplomacy <laughs> Failed podcast started in May 2012. Uh, so we've got eight years and a bit to celebrate here. Zach today is going to be answering all the questions you have about everything from what did we write? Uh, do you have sorry? Here's the here's the blurb. Do you have questions about diplomacy, failure, or the concept of time itself? Well, this might be the session for you. Zach Twomley, world renowned host of When Diplomacy Fails, is here to answer your questions in a 40 minute QA extravaganza. So start submitting those questions now. I'm going to minimize, and um, but I will be your interlocutor uh, pro tem. Cool. Okay. Oh, those wow, that don't so. know, it's just me. It is just you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll shut up in a it's second. Just, all right. But for those who don't know, if you look at the bar at the bottom of your screen, you'll see call to action, ask a question, etc. cetera. Um, ask a question is your button um, that you want to start asking questions for. And if you don't have questions, you can still go to that and you can upvote which questions you most want Zach to answer. Now I'll be quiet. Zach, take us away. <laughs> cool. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I don't know where I can see who is is following or not, but um, cool. This is so great to be here and thank you for joining me. Had a, a little bit of a, a freak out there with the with the connection and everything, but it's all good now. So I just want to thank you first and foremost for, for joining me, for paying to be part of this really exciting thing we're doing. And those of us in Agora really believe that this is gonna be really, really exciting now and in a few years time. But yeah, I'll, I'll give it my best go today and I'll answer, maybe not in the concept of time, but any questions about myself, about the PhD, about stuff that we would do in, in, in podcasting lives, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, I, for myself, have some talking points. If you guys get a bit shy, I'd happily provoke some conversation. Not arguments, just polite conversations. We'll, we'll make sure that diplomacy doesn't fail. We'll, we'll keep it nice and uh, nice and neat and nice and tidy. And hopefully no one's feelings will be... Uh, will be offended. Oh, here we go. We've got some coming in now. That's good to see. Nice. Let's That's start with, cool. Let's okay. start with the first one. Already got an upvote from Ian Daly. Yeah. Where might diplomacy nice. fail over the next year or two? Oh, <laughs> this is going to get a, it's going to get a bit dirty and stuff, but I think <laughs> it does. Well, first of all, the terrifying thing is if you'd asked me this question last year, there'd be fewer answers. It's like, the world's gotten more unsafe in the last literally 12 months. A lot of it, I think, is probably do more with COVID, almost as though, like with normal people getting out of lives, almost state leaders, if they've been locked down, they now have a, uh, a feeling that they need to get all this burst of energy out. I just imagine a few being in some bunk somewhere to wait the worst of coronavirus out. And then once it kind of dies down, he's like, okay. Keep an eye on, and he'll look, look at Ukraine or Georgia or anything like that. No, seriously, I think I think forgotten about North Korea, and I think there's going to be another North Korea scare in the next few months because they have to remind us that they're there almost you know, with a, an extreme dictator like that. They have to be always at the forefront of the news just so they'll be seen. National honor, in my day. If only someone was doing a PhD on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I. All right, Zach, I'm interrupting you right now because uh, I thought it was me, but uh, you're having some audio and connectivity problems. So you've gone, you've gone, uh, oh, let's see. You need to toggle your mic back on. I can't do it for you. So you've gone mute. I don't know why. That may have actually been my fault. 
So if you hover over your screen, sorry, everyone, it's, it's entirely possible that the admin has totally blown this for you guys, um, which is like, you know, I had one job. Um, but if you hover over your own screen, uh, you'll see this, this microphone with a slash through it option, and you can toggle that back on. It's also possible that you, if you can't toggle it back on, what might be going on is that you have lost your mic connection. It's all right. This was this is not the first this is not the first technical hiccup we've had in this conference, and I guarantee you it will not be the last. We've got all sorts of great technical hiccups still to come. One option, Zach, if you're really in trouble, feel free to reload um, and I can get you back in. This is why they pay us the big bucks. Yes, accepted. There we go. Okay. Is that working? So, oh, I'm so Mr. sorry. Trump, been... It's all good. We can hear you oh. now. Um, <laughs> where we lost you was uh, you were talking about the North Korea scare and their need for attention and national honor. Um, you may have some Wi Fi oh, yeah. connectivity issues. If you do, I will pipe up. Okay. Thank you. I should have prefaced this by saying it was a storm yesterday and the previous day in Ireland. So that could have had something to do with that. I know my parents lost internet completely and they were only like five minutes living away, but I thought we got out of the clear. Maybe it's just some residual stuff. Uh, I'll do my best to speak as, as clearly as I can. I should be all right with doing that. So, uh, well, okay. So you're talking about like kind of Russia and like national honor and that, that kind of thing. I was really just saying, um, I wish that so would do something on national honor kind of thing because wink wink nudge nudge i'm doing it for the phd and actually it's fascinating that i've been looking into it but it's just um okay no that's fine sorry i thought we had another issue there um oh no 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 it's fine you can still sorry. hear you but you're irish white folks <laughs> yeah you're a bit choppy what i may actually suggest is um if you're not able to improve your Wi-Fi, as much as I hate to say it, um, uh, it may be worth toggling off your camera to preserve bandwidth for the moment um, and and doing audio there. And I'll uh, let you know how that's... Actually, you're sounding okay now. Okay, wow. Do I? Okay. Maybe, maybe it fluctuates a bit or something. Um, well, why don't we just move to another question then before I ruin things even further? Uh, <laughs> throw one at me there, Eric. We move on. We've Maybe got we'll one that national honor again. Yeah, you're sounding great right now. So um, our top upvoted question right now is other than Bismarck, okay. who do you consider to be the most effective diplomat in history and the least effective diplomat in history? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, oh, that's good. Um, Oh, wow, so difficult. And I know I said, ask me anything, but like putting me on the spot like this. Uh, I would say Metternich definitely is up there, definitely, and Talleyrand as well for what he did for France and for his longevity. The thing these three men all have in common is their longevity. And that's, I think, a real key to, uh, oh no. I'm cutting. Are we okay? Oh, for goodness sake. We can hear you, but <laughs> yeah, I think it's your connection. I would, I suggest going um, camera off and let's preserve that audio feed. I know. You're just yeah, so, sure. Like, you're okay. so beautiful, um, but. I made the shelf and everything. <laughs> okay, let's see if this helps, folks. And uh, let's see if this. All right, it looks like Zach kicked himself out by mistake. And we are learning that, uh, we're learning that storms will get in our way. Everyone, I see everyone is still sticking around. Your patience is 
uh, is fabulous. Let me see if I can get Zach back in as soon as I can. Um, yeah. Okay. Wow. Guys, I'm so sorry. This is ludicrous. And to think I did the training last night and the internet was fine. Um, can you hear me all right there, Eric? We can hear you okay for now. Um, if you need to, if you need to toggle video, it's going to be that button, not the X, but the one that looks yeah. like a camera. So I'll let you know if you, okay. I just, go. you've that, got, that was just done there. Great. So you've got maybe that will down. help a little. You got video down and audio is five by five. Take it away. So, uh, you, were, okay. you were speaking of Metternich. Yes, I was saying that it's so hard to choose, but I think these three men, the Bismarck and, of course, uh, Talleyrand and Metternich, all they have in common is not just their talent, but their longevity. And that's why I think it's so hard to find, like, really great diplomats. But I think they really stick out when, like, they, they stick around for so long. So that's what the roundabout way of me saying, I would like to say... Metternich, but then I kind of feel like I should say Talleyrand, but then I haven't even looked at the 70. In hundreds all that much, and I know that there's comments that's kind of like Megal, because that's the era that we're going to be looking at, and I'm really looking forward to it, but there is just such a wide variety of people to choose, and that's what I love, like the more, the further out you go, the, the more that you can kind of get in touch with and kind of find i've really really appreciated that with with phd that i've been going into areas that, that i never really thought that i would um so it says you're getting me in and out mostly in guys i am so sorry about this it's so frustrating um i can see your chats by the way in, in the corner uh but do like okay <laughs> power on me friend go go nicely done all righty um Sweet, okay. So, yeah, I was just rambling a bit there, but I, okay, so let's move on to kind of the worst person who I think is the worst. And I think you could make a case, and it's kind of tragic, but a lot of uh, prime ministers in Italy in the late 19, or, or late 1800s, rather, um, they were uh, very much trying to kind of blow hot smoke, especially in the direction of France. And I think they were, do they were doing that because they were trying to basically pick an ally to, or pick an enemy to kind of rouse the nation together with. And they, they tried to find one with France, but it didn't really work. And that was one of the major reasons the Triple Alliance went on for so long, even though everyone knew that it wasn't going to work, was because the Italians needed an enemy and Germany was too far away to be that enemy. It didn't really make sense, but Austria was right there. So they, they, didn't, they, like, they wanted to be angry at Austria, but they couldn't. So they had to direct the attention at France instead. And then by making France mad, they couldn't team up with France. So then they had to team up with Italy and then with Germany. Of course, when the war happened, that didn't matter. But of course, I remember doing one of those things while the names kind of all just fall apart a little bit. So, but yeah, certainly for those Italians, All right, I'm going to re-summon Zach here. Everyone who's sticking with us, again, we here we go, accepted and reconnecting. All right, Zach, you are back. Yes, I am. Am I great? Yes. So what we've what we heard from you, I actually think you answered the question quite well. So what we heard from you was um, 
uh, that, you know, in addition, we heard all your best and that the worst uh, were the Italian prime ministers of the late 1800s who ended up picking a fight mm. with the French uh, because they couldn't pick a fight with the Austrians or the Germans. And, yeah. uh, uh, and, and I'm assuming this led them into a number of, or into at least one unnecessary war that probably did not go well for them. Absolutely. Yes, it did. Very true. And I think that was the, uh, that was the big forgotten thing. Cause they often look at it. They often look at the likes of um, like the triple Alliance and they wonder oh, why did that happen? And like, how did it stay when people knew it wasn't going to be honored when it came down to it? Cause the Italians didn't want to fight with Austria. And really it came down to weird ingredients like the kind of personalities of those Italian prime ministers of the late 1800s. It's just what I was looking at earlier in the context of honor again, because I'm going to be blabbing about this, but because, um, because, oh, folks, I know what it was. I know what it was. It was my, my wife was using, uh, poor wife was using Netflix. Oh, that's what it was. I'm going to put on the camera now. I know, I know, I'm sorry, it's so obvious. Uh, so, uh, are we back then? Is that better? Yes, okay, great. That was like, oh, sorry. Okay, fab, great, fantastic, okay. Um, that's, that's wonderful news. <laughs> oh, you guys, I should send you all like a, a, bottle, a bottle opener in the mail or something, I love those things. Um, I should send you everything for putting up with all this rubbish anyway let's uh let's move into another uh let's move into another thing you got it so um, next from chris you haven't done that many episodes on diplomacy failures in antiquity is that on the program for the future absolutely i would love to look into all of the different uh wars that the romans used to kind of expand and i'd love to kind of measure the times when like they used like kind of genuine diplomacy when they're kind of like we need to keep this alliance going for say two three four generations or the really insincere diplomacy when they're like we're making this treaty so that they'll stay away from us for a year or two and then when it expires we'll attack so that's the kind of thing i'm i'm really really interested in trying uh of course source material and you have to build a whole series around that but this is the kind of thing i daydream about when uh, when I have too much time on my hands or when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, all the new podcasts I could do and the Romans wars of like expansion, wherever it was in their empire, I would definitely love to look into something like that. Um, which one specifically? I think the likes of the Gallic Wars and that kind of thing or the Punic Wars. I've already, I've done one on the second Punic Wars, like my second episode. I ever did, but uh, for the next 10 episodes, maybe. And then build probably what I'd have to do, um, because you have to plot these things. And if I want to give like each kind of little Roman war, I'd probably look at the but. I mean, I think the Gallic Wars, the Punic Wars, I'd like to look at the first wars and the wars with like Masson as well. They have to stay at peace with for a long time. So the diplomacy would have to be genuine. Uh, and it would have to be effective. It's either good, good diplomacy, their actual diplomatic skill and action weren't going to honor a treaty and that if they were going to honor it then they really did make sure that, that the Rome Wars that kind of thing uh, and maybe give it a look at some of as well I really want to say anything um I'm going to, uh, yes Rob Ireland does have the Activity is Australia, especially in this apartment today. <laughs> On this occasion, oh dear, 
um, and see if that helps. And then maybe if I turn off the video, then you guys will be able to hear me. Well, that's Our next question, when Zach's back, uh, Chris stops. I'm going to go to your way. Um, Chris stops is a good friend and general troublemaker uh, in all things, um, and uh, he's he's going to be asking about Tyleran versus Bismarck versus Stalin, um, and he's got, of course, his own uh, his own answer there. Um, we will be so we've got what we've got left in terms of questions so far. And we've got about 20 minutes left in the show. Um, so we've got, in addition to that, we've got three other questions. The funniest diplomatic failure that you've ever read about. Um, contemporary diplomatic exchange of situations that are the, that you reckon are the most failure-y. And, um, uh, and can you briefly summarize how you see the diplomatic position of Europe prior to 1618, which is one I'm really looking forward to. Let me get Zach back on. Ah, there we go again. Behold, yes. behold, he's come back again from the dead. <laughs> You're looking good now. So we got to hear we got to hear a lot about your intent to um, uh, to to look at to try to dive in and, and better explore, in particular, where the Romans either actually failed in diplomacy or versus when they were intentionally being bad at diplomacy mm. because they wanted to get into a war. Um, and before we move on to Kristaps' uh, question, was there anything you wanted to elaborate on there? I think I've kind of beaten that down as much as I can. I just don't want people to get too excited and think I'm planning one of those kinds yeah. of podcasts. Uh, as much as I would love to, um, well, first of all, probably wouldn't upload anyway because the internet's so bad, so what's the point? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I don't want to... I don't want to make a plan for myself because I always do. I have like a week or two of spare time and I start something. Like that's how Bismarck happened because I was like, oh, I've got a week or two and then this three-month monster comes along. So maybe I just need to be more careful. <laughs> yeah, so we can, we can move on if you want to field maybe the most the most recent one or whichever one's next. So I've got, um, my best. yeah, the next in the, actually the, the one I promised everyone was coming next uh, is from, um, Christoph Andriessen's, uh, who is a good friend and troublemaker and host of the Eastern Border podcast, and he oh, asked, that guy. <laughs> yeah, that troublemaker. So he asked, <laughs> "Quote: Talleyrand versus Bismarck, which one's better? Or Stalin? Obviously, Stalin." <laughs> I mean, you like Stalin makes such a convincing case. I just have to go with Stalin. I mean, what else? What else am I going to do? But why stop? They're going to get me. Are they going to get me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They're waiting outside the door, making sure I give the right answer. But give the right answer passionately, you know, like I really mean it. No. Uh, Stalin, I think it's easy to kind of look at Stalin as a good diplomatist, but whether he realized it or not, he had people under him who were far superior, the likes of Molotov, who he was so jealous of, really, that he kind of tortured once he got like on in years, once Stalin got on in years, that is, he kind of tortured Molotov and Stalinist psychologists, I would say would probably, no, actually, Chris, you can probably tell us if this is true or not, because you've looked into him much more than I have. But when Stalin got really old and really anti-Semitic, uh, those two things weren't connected. He just got more anti-Semitic as he got older. But anyway, he, uh, he then started to kind of, needle Molotov in any way that he could. And one of them was with the pogroms, but he did it in other ways as well, like through his wife, that kind of thing, because his wife was Jewish. But yeah, the uh, the inference is, I think Stalin was not all that remarkable or talented, and he knew that. He knew that full well. And as a result, then, if you were smart, you have to be careful not to be too smart around him, because that would be suspicious. Because mm, you could take his job if you're too smart. Um, so yeah, sorry, Stalin doesn't come close, but uh, I appreciate that a lot of people would have said Stalin had they been under as much pressure as people in his regime had been to always give the right answer. I better just stop talking. Um, what about what yeah. about Talleyrand versus Bismarck? Because you named both of them as some of the greats. 
Oh, that's hard. You see, it's such a different situation because Talleyrand was trying to rebuild France, whereas Bismarck was trying to build Prussia. If that, I mean, I suppose both were trying to re. Like, you could argue that Bismarck was trying to like rebuild Prussia after the Napoleonic Wars. So, in a way, it's kind of similar, but on vastly different scales, and um, because of the dynamic that's different. Like Talleyrand had a defeated France, but he still had a united France, whereas Bismarck had like. Uh, not necessarily defeated Prussia, but the fact that he had to grow it so much, so much more than he, he started with for it to satisfy him, uh, shows that they faced vastly different challenges. But I would go with Bismarck, but that's just because it's me and I have to go with Bismarck. And I also haven't looked into Talleyrand as much, but I know like broad things about him, and I know that there is a uh, historical disagreement about like it is with Bismarck, whether he liked France or whether he was just opportunistic, that kind of thing. So in that sense, they are connected. And it might be fascinating to do a kind of more direct comparison on them someday, like do a kind of side by side thing and see uh, which one kind of measures up or which one it ticks which boxes. Yeah, let's, let's pretend, pretend that we're professionals and psychoanalyze these people. It would be fun. Uh, but yeah, so I, I would have to say Bismarck. But I mean, was there any doubt? It's me, in fairness. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, we can move to uh, move to the next one, I think, Eric. So uh, this is from Andrew Fields. Got a few upvotes, um, so it's our next in the queue. Um, and we can stop being professional or stop uh, feeling like we need to be professional for a little bit because uh, Andrew asks, what is the funniest diplomatic failure that you've ever read about? Oh, wow. Um, um, you see... Kind of hard because so it's like, like I have uh, I have my kind of nice trying to All right, I will try to resummon the Zach. I'm going to make sure he answers this one. I've been looking very forward to this answer, and now he's got a little bit more time to think about it. <laughs> I find it dark and ironic that they thought they were going to get oh, um, again. I'm just going to keep talking, all right? So if I. Uh, Okay. All right. My video is gone. No, it's not. What is happening? Okay. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Okay. I don't. It's just flashing between loads. The different screens, maybe I don't know what this, what the heck is happening. Um, yeah, I can't even click on video; it's just glitching all over the place. Okay. Can you turn off my video for me? Because it's it just isn't working when I press the button. Oh, thank your you. Video okay, is great. Off and your so audio on this microphone, yes. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Yep. So I actually, I'm, I really okay. want to hear the answer Very to this. And, and you've now done your practice run, which nobody heard. So now you're sharp. What is the funniest failure of diplomacy that you've ever seen? Let me just cut out again. Oh. 
Oh, come on. We can hear you, Chief. Okay, cool. Okay, I just couldn't hear you for a minute there. Um, that's grand. Um, so I know I've built this up an awful lot. The reason why is because I kind of have to give a, a previous kind of like a preface to my answer because it's like it feels almost like I'm finding suffering of people humorous, but that's not what it is. I just think like the like is it's darkly ironic that the Italians were trying to expand like everyone else into Africa and they get a bloody nose. And then once they get that bloody nose, it's miraculously discovered that uh, it's miraculously discovered that, oh, uh, Abyssinians were from uh, Europe originally, and they're the they're like really white people. They're not actually black, so we didn't lose to black people. Like that kind of thing, I find darkly humorous. But like, and as a diplomatic failure, going back to the the war, obviously people suffered and died. So, but for a diplomatic failure that um, a diplomatic failure that doesn't result in any suffering, at least initially, when I was looking at Bismarck and learning about how he became so anti-Austrian, looking at Austria's attempts to kind of placate him beforehand, um, I think is uh, uh, is really, really fascinating. Like, the, the like, Austria seemed to try really, really hard to try and get it done, and, um, and it just didn't work. And if you've listened to several of the episodes, you'll know that in one of them, he, the, an Austrian comes to try and bribe him but uh, he uh, he nearly pushes the guy down the stairs, or he doesn't push him down the stairs. He makes him aware of how big he, Bismarck, is compared to this small Austrian guy who tried to bribe him, and how close his close proximity to the stairs, or something like that. That to me is a is a fantastic diplomatic fail because the Austrians just didn't know who they were dealing with, and neither did the Prussians or the Germans either. So they weren't alone in that, at least. Uh, you can't really blame them too much. It's like, it just takes me back. Um, Luke said that we need the Tally Ryan Bismarck episode. Bismarck, but even just to look into Tally Ryan more would be class. Would be so much fun. Very enjoyable. And of course, I'm I'm fantastic at taking on uh, new projects that maybe aren't necessarily what I, what I have time for or anything like that. Um, so that's the uh, funniest one, I suppose, a kind of very tenuous, a tenuous link to it, but it's like what's immediately at the front of my mind. I've got so much historical period is stuffed into there, uh, and I've been filling it with loads of college stuff lately, so there's only a, a certain amount of space, and the stuff I'm looking at at isn't so funny. Uh, so it's it's kind of hard to think of a funny one immediately, but yeah, the, the Italians always come to mind. And again, just an example of trying to get something done through diplomacy, but ending up having the completely opposite other way around. Uh, like you end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy, like making France mad at you and then not being able to join with them because they're mad at you because you want to attack Italy or you want to attack Austria, but you can't. You know the story. But uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's fascinating. I love all that kind of stuff. Um, I think we could probably take, oh, of course, there's the War of the League of Cambrai, which was from 1508 to 1516. That war is hilarious because pretty, pretty much everyone changes sides uh, in the space of eight years. It's just, it's definitely a war I want to do again in more detail. I did it a while ago uh, for episode 21, I think it was, but um, definitely check that out if you're interested. It's early 2013, exact time I believe. So, so yeah, you'd be, uh, you'd be in good company. Um, what do we talk about next there, Eric? I'm yeah, so we have six, six minutes want? left and two more questions. So we're doing great on pace. Um, this cool. question is from uh, Dionisio Antonio. I uh, hope I got that right. And okay. uh, Dionisio asks, which are the contemporary diplomatic exchanges or situations that you reckon are the most failure-y? Most failure-y? Nice. I like it. I think I like, it's a great word. word. I think or, you need to coin or, it, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of word I definitely mess up when I'm trying to say it while I'm recording, though. So I know it would send my sister insane because she'd have to edit it like 20 times. Um, I'd say most failure contemporary diplomatic exchange situations. Oh, jeepers. Well, again, there's so many. And uh, I kind of decided I've gradually become less kind of, less kind of, um, I've gradually become less kind of afraid of what people will think about, about my political opinions. Like, You'll know that if you look at me on Twitter at the moment, which just trumps 
response mostly to pretty much everything that happens in the world. But I also, obviously, the most, most contemporary diplomatic failure one, I think Brexit is probably the most glaring one and it's right next door to me. So with all the stuff about the posturing and all the anti-EU and everything and now COVID's happened and, and it's just, it goes to show how important it is to have friends in the world. And the UK government, it was a blink and you miss a thing. The UK government um, announced that essentially they weren't going to make the deadline for negotiating uh, Brexit. So they pushed, they pushed back one of their major red lines and after having originally said said that they wouldn't do anything of the sort, that they'd never in a million years uh, like have to renegotiate because if they ran out of time, it would just be no deal Brexit. But then when they came down to it, of course, that wasn't quite true at all. And you have the situation you have now where Britain really does need friends, just like everyone does at this moment in time. But the EU, the EU would be their traditional source of friends at this point, really, especially with America being the way it is. I mean, if you want something from Trump's America, you have to give it something in response. There doesn't seem to be any good will anymore because Trump now has a base that assumes you want America's help and assumes you'll be willing to give an awful lot for it. So these are just my observations in the world. You did say contemporary. So apologies if these uh, these these things offend you. But yes, Luke, it does need to exist in a, in, in a world of Brexit. Like, absolutely. Uh, it, that word was invented for it as an adjective. A very good very good so i'll definitely bring failure into uh into <laughs> into our podcast nicely done um so yeah i'd say just brexit has closed so many doors for britain and opened far fewer than they expected to be open i think they thought there'd be way more options than there are now but i mean hindsight's 2020 they couldn't see that's the thing though boris can blame the covid and everything for every anything that goes wrong with uh brexit now covid is the answer for why so in a way, it's kind of bad because they get a jail out of free card. They have a get out of jail free card. There we go. I got there. Let's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think people are only starting to realize that now, that now they have this get out of jail free card. So all their base now will be able to say, well, it's not their fault. They would have done Brexit. Boris believes in Brexit, but he can't bring it because it's COVID and it's not his fault. And you're just, you're just angry at him. Um, yes. Very good. Brexit, when diplomacy gets failure I like it. I, that's, that's a t-shirt right there. That is definitely. Jail out of free. I say that loads, actually, yeah. I actually say that an awful lot. <laughs> I say it the wrong way around so often. Anyway, we've got one more question left and not a whole heap of time. So uh, what was that last question there, Eric? Yes, boss. It is from Rob Coughlin. Mm -hmm. And Rob asks, listening to the 30-year war episodes... Can you briefly summarize how you see the diplomatic position of Europe prior to 1618? Okay, thanks, Rob. Only you could ask me to try and fill a subject that's filled like 30 books or something. In you less have than two minutes. minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, let's go off on a high. So there's so many different things going on here. There's the religious, there's the economic, there's the social economic, there's the military, there's the aspect of honor there's the there's the competition between the Habsburg and the Bourbon dynasty there's the leftover stuff from the French wars of religion there's all the other leftover stuff of distrusting else getting information into the future you can confessional uh, hostility as well of course between the Protestants and the Catholics, so it's it's a whole mess, a whole heap of mess. But the thing that really sets it over the edge is the Third Bohemian Rebellion in, in yes, less than a decade. But again, those Bohemian revolts have to be tied into the explanation for why it happens as well. This is a random way, way of me saying that um, yes, it takes an awful long time. And yeah, I'm going to take Ben's job now because I just did this sort of not really. In, uh, in X amount of seconds, but yeah, there's so much going on. As we, we took 16 episodes to explain it, and every single episode was quite meaty and chunky, so it's not something you can really ignore. A Vittles back dynasty and its competition with the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs just didn't get on very well with anyone. Poland as well, you had to look at Poland because of the Vassal relationship, and of course with uh, the Dutch and the English and everything else, with the Dutch and with Spain. Okay, less than 20 seconds. 
Uh, you can't ignore anything you're looking for something. And when, how often can you say that in historical things like these? It's, it's madness. So yeah, don't forget the Swiss and even like the little tiny German states. It goes on and on and on. Thank you so much, folks, for joining me. Sorry to mess up. I love you. And awesome. Goodbye, Thank you so much. Apparently, or we're still Thank live. So it says live still. So yeah, I got, I got it. I'll shut you down. Thank you so much, Zach. For those who somehow don't know, Zach is the host of When Diplomacy Fails. You can find him at wdfpodcast.com and listen to eight years of just riveting material. Um, so if you've got a road trip coming up, I've got a suggestion for you. Um, and with that, everyone, we'll see you at the next talk. Thanks so much for joining. Wow. Are you still there, Eric? <laughs> I am. So is everyone. I'm just making sure I shut this down properly. Oh, thank you so much, guys. I'm so sorry about all that. I must do a proper Q&A sometime and uh, actually get to do these things properly. I'm so disappointed about the internet, but um, That's thank what you, podcast. Rebecca. That's so nice of you. That's what yeah. podcast is for, my friend. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta close this yeah. so that I can take my ad okay. piece over. Everyone, uh, feel Thank free you. to reach out with more questions to Zach. It might end up in a podcast show. We'll talk to y'all later.